Okay, so um, I'm here today to talk about parallel programming. Now, um, the gathering has invited me back. We've got nothing on the big screen. So if someone could get that going, that'd be great. Um, and I've been programming uh, for about 25 years now. When, when I started programming, we only had a single processor that we could use. Um, and that's, that's nice and all, but it's a bit slow. And the problem with only having a single processor, moving right, yep, is that you can only do so many things. And over the last 20 years, those single processors have been increasing in speed. But in the last kind of five or six years, even up to 10 years, you guys will have noticed that your CPU clock speed, right? Everything was about clock speed. You've got, oh, I've got a one gigahertz machine. I've got a two gigahertz machine. I've got a three gigahertz machine. Where's my seven gigahertz machine that I'm supposed to have now, right? I don't have one of those. I have 2.6, 2.8, three if I'm lucky. And this end of single CPU speed increase has meant that we, we need to find other ways to make our computers faster. And you can see here that as, as the CPUs developed, they've stopped individually getting faster. And that's partly to do with electricity. Right? How do you make a CPU go faster? You certainly don't sort of pump up electricity and increase the speed at which the bits move around inside the CPU. No, no. What they've done is they keep making things smaller and smaller and smaller. They put them closer together. Right? Electricity moves at a set speed. And so if you want things to happen quicker, you make the distance shorter. Now, that was great. When we were, we were at 90 nanometers, that was all good. At 45 nanometers, that was all good. Um, and it kept getting smaller. We're now down to about 16. Right? And they're starting to have problems because when you get things that close together, the number of atoms between the gates that you're using get so small that you get quantum tunneling between the signals. Right? When the signal switch, when the transistors switch, they actually affect the other transistors. And so you, you, we can't squeeze it any tighter. So the speed of a, a single core has pretty much stopped progressing. Right? Single cores aren't going to go much faster. So if you ever look at some of the discussions that are out there, they're saying that parallelism, right? Parallel is going to be the new normal. Not one of you have a CPU in your machine that is a single core. I hope. Did anybody bring a single core machine? Or are you just too embarrassed to admit it? No, none of you will have a single core machine, really. Um, so it's going to be multi-core you're going to have to program in parallel to get the most out of your machine. Now, we already know that, that we've done this for graphics. Right? Graphics, very early on, you've now got thousands of processors in your GPU. Um, interestingly, uh, a number of universities have started saying, well, you know that whole OO programming thing? Yeah, that's awfully like 2000s. Um, we're going to drop OO, and we're going to include parallel instead. Right, so CMU have dropped their OO at first year and put in parallel programming instead. And that's going to be the new normal. The new thing that you guys, if you're going to be programming, are going to have to understand is how to work in parallel. So if you have a look at the things that are parallel, um, you've got your standard CPUs, uh, your DPUs are very parallel, and your mobile devices. Right? Your mobile devices are now multi-core. Right? You buy a new phone, it's going to be multi-core. In fact, you buy one of the, the very new HTC phones or, or Samsung phones, you're going to get a quad core plus one. You're going to get five cores in your phone. Right? That's craziness. So if we have a look, currently you've got a quad core. Now, it may say in your profiler that you've got eight cores running in your i7. Right? Most of you will only have four cores and have two threads per core. Right? It's actually multi-threading and multi-core. Right? So it's actually just running, running four. But four is still the start of parallelism. But it's not going to stop at four. Right? It's going to be eight. It's going to be 16. It's going to be 32. It's going to get more and more. And the Tegra, um, the Tegra 3 there, the mobile pro operator, uh, the mobile CPU, is four cores for your games, 
and one core for when you're doing normal stuff. Right? It has a low speed one core for when you're making phone calls and you're sort of text messaging. But then you want to play a game, it spins up and it's basically the same as, as an i3. So, games. Now, games have always pushed technology. Right? The reason why we have multi-core GPUs is because of you guys and your ability to spend money on making your games look nicer. Yeah? Now, um, GPUs, we've got pretty good at parallelizing them, and games use the GPU more than anything else. Right? It's designed for games, and we work the ass out of that GPU. Um, and so it's simple maths, it divides up a problem, and it has thousands of processes. Um, the CPU, we're still not very good at using those cores. Um, I found Civ 5 very irritating because the turn times on the AI were so long and I bring out my profiler, it's only using two of my cores and one of those is for all the other stuff, right? It, it, it's sitting there not using the power of my machine. And on the CPU and having multi-threaded CPU, we need to think differently about the way we program, about the way we solve problems, about the way we think. Right? It's a whole new approach on the CPU. Um, if you look at Killzone 2 on the PS3, um, Killzone 3 is much better than this. All of the white area in that profile is all the downtimes. Right? The white is where it's not using the SPUs at all right? in the PlayStation 3. Now, um, Guerrilla Games are really good and they've spent six years to try and get the power out of the, the PS3. And now we're moving to new architectures and we're moving to more threads and more complexity. Right? This is hard stuff to do. And so we need to look at sort of what they're doing, why they're breaking it up, how it works. Okay, so can we, we'll start with something you guys know about and, and I'll, I'll refer back to A star and pathfinding. One of the things that's actually quite slow in a lot of strategy games is when you have thousands of units all trying to work out where to go. Right? And they have to find paths through the world. And they start interacting with each other, and there's a lot of calculation. Um, now, if you've got multi-cores, you can actually make pathfinding much faster. Right? The standard pathfinding, you just kind of pick a direction, and you have a heuristic that tells you how to go in that direction, and then you move down there. Um, with multi-cores, you can use particles. You can fire lots of options find lots of different paths, and as soon as somebody finds a short one, you grab that and go. Right? So there are new ways of thinking. Rather than saying, OK, I've got to find one path, I'm going to step down the path all the way, and when I find the dead end, I'll backtrack, and I'll step down here. I clone myself into 35,000 of me and send us all out looking for the path. Right? And that's much faster. One of us will find it. Right? The rest I can just throw away, but one of us will find the path. Now. Practical parallelism. Um, at universities, you'll be taught a lot about, well, not a lot, you'll, you'll start to learn about parallel programming. Um, if you look at the practicalities of, programming, uh, of parallel programming, the theory is relatively easy. Huh? There are kind of two types of parallel programming. Task parallel and data parallel. Now, task parallel programming is where you've got a bunch of mates and they're all doing different jobs. Right? So task parallel is like a well guild. Right? You've each got different guys doing different things with different specializations. You divide up the task and you start doing those. Right? So that's task parallel. Now, in a computer game, you have things like the, the AI, the networking, um, the world simulation, the user interface. These are all different tasks. And so what you do is you can set them up and set them running on different parts of your machine. And what they need to do is communicate with each other. Right? But it's only a little bit of communication because they're doing quite different things. The other type is data parallelism. Data parallelism is where you've got a whole bunch of maths working on the same kind of data. And when it's working on the same kind of data, you, instead of sending everybody off doing their own task, you use the same bit of maths code and you keep running that over and over and over again on each of the processes. Now, this is what the graphics card does. The GPU takes the same set of maths and just keeps running it on new bits of data. 
And so you take that same math and you put it across a thousand processes, you divide up your data, and you start pumping it through. And it's really good for things like rendering. Um, a bunch of physics is relatively easy, collision detections, it's the same math being done again and again and again on different types of data. All right, so task parallel and data parallel. Now, <clears throat> one of the problems that you have when you go to parallelism is that you need to communicate. Right? You need to communicate between the different units that are doing the processing. Now, there are several kinds of communication. The two standard ones are semaphore-based and shared memory. Now, semaphores, um, can any of you read those semaphores? Have we ever taught naval semaphore code? No, okay. It says game, by the way, just so you, that's, that's G-A-M-E across there. Semaphores were used to communicate at great distances between ships. And that's the metaphor we've used for task parallel communication. Right? When we're working on something together, right? say Johannes and I have, have got a task, and we've got to coordinate our behavior. Right? So um, let's say we're, we're uh, making some food or something, right? and we can use the stove. Now, there's only one element going. I need to cook some stuff. Johannes needs to cook some stuff. So we need some way of saying, oh, no, I'm using this resource now and you can use it after me. Right? Otherwise, we just keep swapping our pots off and nothing gets cooked. So I have a semaphore. I raise something saying, no, 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 I'm, I'm grabbing this resource, and I'm going to use it for a while. And I need some sort of signal, right? and the operating system has semaphores so that the communication between these multiple threads works. Um, and I raise a semaphore, and Johannes goes along to use the thing, and you go, oh, oh, oh Simon's already using that. OK, I'll just have to wait. You could also perhaps be the engage signal on the toilet. Right? That's a nice wee semaphore. I raise it to say, no, no, this is engaged. This is a critical section. Only I'm allowed to be in the toilet at the moment. And once I'm finished, I will unlock it and leave. Now, if you're in a, in a complex multi-user system where you've got lots of resources, this can be a problem because if you need, say, the, the printer and the screen, right? if I grab the printer and say, I'm going to use it to print some stuff, and Johannes grabs the screen and says, no, no, I've got the semaphore on the screen, and I say, no, no, I, I need the screen, and he says, no, no, I need the printer. So well, I'm not going to give up my printer until you give me the screen. He says, I'm not going to give up my screen until you give me the printer. Um, and we get deadlocked. Right? It's a conflict, and we get stuck. Right? And so there's lots of strategies in multi-core um, systems and parallel programming that let you resolve those deadlocks. Right? In this case, I'm bigger than he is, right? so I just take what I want. <laughs> Actually, I just pull rank. I'm his lecturer. So, so that will be fine. So there needs to be some resolution system. And this is the thing. When, when you're working in a parallel processing system, you have to worry about your communication and about deadlocks. Right, what happens when two things want the same resource? What happens when two processes are waiting on the same thing to happen? Another thing you can do is called shared memory. Right? This is great when you've got a lot of processes that need to communicate to everybody. Right? Now, the standard thing is a, is a Blackboard or Google Docs is quite a nice way I use personally for shared memory, multi-processor, multi-human communication. Now, what the Blackboard does is when I've got a problem, if I want to use something, if, I want, if I'm locking something, if I'm working on something, I throw it in the shared memory, you can pull it out any time you like. You've still got to worry about write conflicts. Reads are fine, I just read off data, that's all good. If I'm writing to the shared memory, you better not also be writing to the shared memory because we're going to screw things up. Right? Now, with parallel processing, I've, I, I said that, that it's data or task, one of the interesting issues is how much time you spend communicating about stuff. Right? Now, you guys have all done group assignments at university or at school. Right? Now, in a group of you, you set up some tasks, and then you need to talk to each other. And it always takes so long to deal with the talking to each other. Right? 
the communication between tasks is something we call overhead. Right? It's the communication overhead. It's, the, it's all that hassle of having to, to coordinate people on top of what you're planning to do. So not only do you have to work out what your task is going to be like, is it, is it task? Are they different tasks? Are they different things I can give to different people? Or are they things that I can, can use the same bit of code? Uh, is it data parallel? And how much communication will I have? Now, one of the standard techniques is to use a kind of divide and conquer technique when parallel programming. And, oh, I'll go back. Um, now, and this is, this is a, a standard issue with divide and conquer. Um, if it takes one man nine months to paint a house, how long does it take nine men to paint a house? Well, it takes one month. If it takes a woman nine months to have a baby, how long does it take nine women to have a baby? Still going to be nine months, right? Um, some things don't parallelize. Some things have resource limits, which says you just, you just can't put more people on this task. You can't divide it up anymore. Right? If it takes me three minutes to brush my teeth, I might be able to get a second person in and cut it down to a minute and a half if they do the other side. At four people brushing my teeth, I might get down to about 30 seconds. I don't think I can get a fifth person in to brush my teeth. Right? And certainly 10, 15 people hanging around all trying to brush my teeth, it's just not going to work. Right? So there are some things that just do not parallelize. And I have to go back. Now, I've got three different divide and conquer strategies here. Rendering in graphics uses a divide and conquer based on screen space. Right? The reason your GPU is so fast is because it's taking triangles, pumping them through some very simple mathematics and putting them onto a small part of the screen. Right? So what I do is I've got thousands of processors in my GPU. I each pump them a different set of triangles. They do the same maths on it, and they pump it out to the screen. Right? So if I was asking to clean up the gathering at the end of the, the, the week, right, rather than getting one guy to do the whole room, I could divide it up into squares and get 500 people each to clean up their little square, pick it up and take it away. Right? So that's a kind of divide and conquer strategy. If I was working out the total age of my audience here, I could ask one person to go around and ask every individual in the audience. Right? That would be quite slow. Um, I could use a, 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 logri a logarithmic approach, and I could say, well, we'll do it in pairs. Each person tells the person next to them their age, and that pair work out their combined age. Then one representative from that group finds another representative from another group, and they combine, and they combine, and they combine, until in order log in log two, I get the number out. Right? A divide and conquer. I divide up the task into small chunks, and repeatedly do the same operation. Now, the egg hunting approach is, is given a more scientific sounding name, the Monte Carlo sampling approach. Um, you know Monte Carlo is the place where you go and gamble? And that's what it means, right? If you, if you read Monte Carlo sampling technique, it just means we threw some randomness in there and hoped something would work right. All right? Now, that's what a lot of the, the, the speed up you can get in parallelism. Some of it comes from having so many idle processes, you can just try some stuff, right? Throw out some random samples, get a 1,000 processes all to process it, and some of those will be close to the result, right? Some of them will get a result, some won't. You can average them. You can find out various ways of, of getting a good answer from basically an egg hunt, right? If I, hit an Easter egg somewhere in the gathering and got one of you to search for it, that poor bastard's going to take a long time. Um, the Monte Carlo approach would be, OK, just get all of you up, and we'll all rush around the hall randomly looking for the egg. And I can guarantee you'll find it much faster than if you just had one person, unless they cheated and watched me place it. Um, and the last part is delegation, the idea that you can take those tasks and you can give them to different people to do. Now, in the CPU, 
with big heavyweight processing units, we usually do task um, parallelism. We usually do this delegation approach, right? where we're, we're sending different tasks to different people. Now, there is unfortunately a limit to how much we can improve. Um, Amdahl's law is about how much improvement you get based on how serial the task is, right? How much of the task can be parallelized. If you've got a, a task that is 50% serial, it doesn't matter if you add a billion extra CPUs. You're only going to get a 50% speed up because half the job still has to be done by one guy right? because it's serial. This result relies on the next result, relies on the next result, relies on the next result, and if that's true, you, you can't speed it up, right? You can't go faster if there is a serial limit. And so this law says, well, if, if even if 95% if of your task can be turned into a parallel task, you can only go 20 times faster. Right? Even with 65,000 cores, right? you're not going to go 65,000 times faster. You're going to go 20 times faster. Because somebody still has to do all of the serial bit. Right? Now, this is very much like a manager in a, in a job. If I still have to manage everybody, right, I'm still going to have to oversee everything. Doesn't matter if I've got a million people on the job, I still have to go in and check it afterwards. So it might take you, well, let's say if you put 100 people in a room to paint it, right, they get the paintbrush out and boom, one stroke, they're done. So the room gets painted in like, under a minute, I still have to go in there and check it. And if I have to check 100 rooms, I have to physically walk around those 100 rooms. Doesn't matter if all of them were painted in a minute, my task, my serial task of walking around and checking each room is the limiting factor. So onto the question that I actually posed uh, for this, this talk, which was about why are CPUs so slow to play the games, right? You, you, you buy a new CPU, you run it up, and it's not that much faster than the, the machine you used to have, right? Which is really irritating, even though the specs say it's much faster. Well, I break this down into, into three categories. The physics. Okay. Electrons aren't moving any faster than they used to move, right? Electrons are still moving at a third the speed of light. So, with trying to make things smaller, we can't make them faster. So single cores aren't getting faster. We've actually made the transistors small enough that we could pack them tied together, but we now can't because of the quantum tunneling. All right, so we can make them small, but we can't get them close together. So we've hit the single core speed limit. Another problem is the tools that we use. The tools that we as programmers use tend to make us think in serial ways. Right? We teach you guys about if statements and for loops, and we teach you the sequence of programming. We teach you in a this step, then this step, then this step. That's not how the parallel CPUs need to work. They do that, but they're also doing these other steps, and these other ones over here, and this group over here, and this one's down here, and we've got this another one doing a different kind of task. And that's not how we teach you. And it's not what the tools do well. Right? The tools are still very serial focused. Um, the classic example currently is that if you look at, at AIs in a lot of systems, they use Lua, right? the Lua scripting language. You see some of that in, in user interface as well. Now, Lua is a great language for building plug-in AIs. Right? So you get an AI, you can, you can code it up in Lua, and you can plug it into your game. And in fact, like, WoW lets you write your, your own AIs and your own Lua plugins. Right? The problem with Lua is it abstracts you away from the hardware, which means you can't tell it which bits to make parallel. So although it would be really nice if your AI was to be able to parallel and run on multiple tasks and do all those kind of things, because of the way Lua is structured, it means that it's going to run in serial. So your game is going to limit 
on its AI. It's going to hit the AI and go, all right, I just had to step through this one at a time. And so the tools that we're using aren't good enough for the, for the task. And a couple of things about games. One thing is that, that games tend to be serial in their nature. They're a serial experience. We physically don't have the mental capacity to take in 18 screens all at once. So we tend to be running a single process in our, in our own brain, right? Our narrative of the world is a single narrative. It's actually, I, this is a big psychological discussion. Why? Why do we have a single narrative? Right? When we've got this amazing multi-processor system in our head here, right? It's got 10 to the 11 neurons. It's the most massively parallel system on Earth. And yet we get a single narrative running in my head. That, that's that's kind of weird. Um, it's, it, they still don't really know why we don't have like we don't all have multiple personality disorder. Right? Actually, what you can do, in, which you can't quite do on your CPU, but you can in your brain, is that you can cut the corpus callosum. You can cut our brain into two halves, and then you have two distinct personalities that have, have different desires, they want different things, they want to eat different things, they want to wear different clothes. All right? Now, people who have had severe epilepsy, they cut the brain in half, and their parallel system now has two communication, two different processes, right? two full different processes, and they use their body to communicate. Right? What you do is if, you want to, if the right side wants to tell the left side, I want to put on a jersey, it holds up a jersey so that the other side can see it. Right? So they, they communicate through the real world. Right? So humans do the same kind of communication that we need to inside our parallel programming systems. Another problem that we have is that games are inherently interactive. And when you can interact with things, it makes it hard to predict what's going on. And one of the nice things about parallelism is that if you can predict what's going on, you can speed it up. Right? If I know what's coming, I can prepare for it, I can chunk it up, I can break it up into bits that I need, and then I can put that into the parallel system. But because I can interact, because I can change what's going on, I have to every now and again go, oh, OK, so they've turned around. Now I need to load all of that geometry instead of that geometry. Right? The fact that you are constantly changing the rules of the game means that I can't optimize, right? because I don't know what's going to happen next. Now, <clears throat> this all leads us partly to the idea of, of what's coming in the future. Now, the fastest supercomputer is currently got six, 640,000 cores. Right? So that's 80,000 eight-core CPUs. And it's doing 10 petaflops. The human brain, this thing in here, is currently doing about 100 teraflops. Right? This is about 100 times faster than your brain, right? which is pretty impressive. Right? That's, that's, our supercomputers are now faster than each one of these, even though we have 10 to the 11 cores running doing flops. The problem is our brain runs at a, a, a thousand hertz, right? Not even a megahertz. One kilohertz is the fastest the neurons go in your brain. Massively parallel, but quite slow. One of the things that is going to happen in the future is we're going to have neural machines. The, these neural machines will mimic the communication system in the brain, but they'll be doing it much, much faster. And then we'll be doing interesting things in the way the brain does it. One of the interesting things we'll do is, in parallel programming, thinking about partial calculation. If I say a sentence to you like, the old man's glasses are filled with whiskey, huh? that sentence makes sense, the old man's glasses are filled with whiskey. When I started saying the sentence, you probably started thinking about spectacles, right? The old man's glasses are filled with whiskey. Now, whiskey means, oh, no, no, you mean the glasses on the table. 
Now your brain didn't go, hemorrhage, no, ah, stop. Must restart, can't proceed. No, no, it already had a second stream of analysis on that sentence that it could switch to when one of them failed. Now currently, the, your, your computer, when a branch fails, it throws that all away, loads a whole bunch of new instructions, and then tries to keep going. If you've got thousands and thousands of cores sitting there doing nothing, what you do is you just load up all the options on all the different cores. And if something changes, you just switch to the one that's closest to what you need. Another example of that is, is, the, is again, in language. If I said something like, the council refused to see the students because they started a protest. Sounds fair? If I said, the council refused to see the students because they feared a protest. The word they changed its meaning. As I was going through that sentence, I can use an ambiguous word, they, and you work it out later by context. And you can only do that because you are running these multiple threads. Now, the neurological science says this is how the brain works. This is how we process the world. We actually process multiple threads all at once, and the one that is most relevant gets acted on. That's what our machines will need to do in the future. That's what you guys are going to have to think about programming in the future. You don't program a single thread that steps through and does a task. You program a system which goes, takes all the options, all the things that could be happening, processes them all, and then occasionally goes, OK, well, which is the closest to reality? Which is the closest to the way I want things to be? I'll start using that. Right? You've all seen the, the multiple universe stories, right? Where there are multiple universes out there and we're just in one of them. Well, that's what your GPU and your CPU will start doing. They're going to start predicting all the things you might want to do. Now, you can already see this on some web browsers. And what you do is on a web browser, you've got 50 links that the person could click. So you pre-fetch all of those. And so when you click on something, bang, I'm there, because I've already loaded all that material. And then I've looked and said, oh, from that page, they could have clicked any one of these links. And so I'll load all of those. And so your computer can start doing that when you're playing a game. Right? You could fire, you could fire your, your weapon, you could move to the left, you could jump, you could take an action. If your computer is predicting all of those and pre-calculating all of those, it means you've got no lag at all because it's already worked out what to do. Right? That is going to be where we start getting the real speed up and the real performance increase in gaming from massive numbers of CPUs. Right? We're not going to get it from making our AIs even more distributed than they are. We're not going to get it from putting 50 networking, call, uh, networking threads out there. We're going to get it from prediction. We're going to get it from the way the brain does multi-parallelism. Now, I finished pretty early. Um, and this was a, a HIG meme that came up. Um, my students, one of my students put up, ask a simple question, get a two-hour lecture. Um, so I thought I would ask questions, but give you a warning that if you ask a question, I can talk about it for quite a long time. So do I have any questions? Come up, come up. Yeah, we've even got a stage now. Yep. But wouldn't, um, when you have predictions like that, the demand extremely much from the processes? Right, so the, the question is, if, if you're going to do a massive amount of prediction, won't that require an enormous amount of work from the CPUs and an enormous amount of communication between them? Well, the simple answer is, well, yes. Yes, it will require a lot from the CPUs. And the thing is that already at the moment, your quad-core device is not really being used as much as it could be used. Your next generation with your eight cores or 16 cores, we're not even sure what we're going to do with all of that. Right? Um, already the GPU, when, when you buy a new GPU, you take the old GPU and you leave it plugged in, and certain systems like the NVIDIA stuff can use that as your physics core. 
right? It can roll off the physics into your old GPU card. We've got thousands of cores in our GPU. You're going to buy a new one. What are you going to do with the old one? Right? It's got all this processing power. You don't want to get rid of it because it's really powerful, but you've got a new shiny card. Um, so what are we going to do with all that power, all that latent power that's sitting in your machine? And so yes, although the car consumption goes up massively, it's partly because we've got all these cores hanging around not doing anything. Right? Most of the time, your machine is idle. Right? It sits there waiting for you to do something interesting. Right? And you're sitting there typing an email. And it's so incredibly boring for it. Right? It's got huge power, and you're typing email. The, the slowest part of the computer system is me as a user. My big fat sausage fingers moving up and down is incredibly slow. Already incredibly slow. So the way we're going to get around that is by looking at how, how do I make the system use its power to make it easier for me. Right? And one way is to start predicting what I'm going to do. Right? So the parallel processing breaks up the world and says, well, these are all the things that his big sausage fingers could do. Right? And so whenever he does anything, I'm ready. I'm there. I've already worked it out. Right? Um, now, it also means that we can start doing some interesting pre-prediction on what you might want to do. If we've got enough processing power that we can have all of these threads running, just like at the moment, what humans do with each other right, is when we're having a conversation, I keep predicting what you're about to say. Right? It's, it's part of the, the way we understand each other in a crowded room, right? when you're at a party, because you sort of know what the person's going to say. And that requires you to do some processing, some understanding. Now, computers are pretty bad at doing that with humans. Right? Humans are too ambiguous. They're not very good at predicting what we're about to do. But that's because we were only trying to do it with one. If you can predict every possible answer, much like a chess game, you predict every possible move, and you sort of work out what is likely to be happening, you can use the power that is in these machines already, and is going to be more there, to improve the computer's ability to predict what we're about to do, to understand our motivations for things, to start understanding why we are doing things by looking at all the possibilities, working out which ones we took and why we took those. Right? Now, as a programmer, your responsibility uh, is to start moving beyond thinking in serial, this statement, then this statement, then this statement, and start thinking, well, OK, what are all the potential outcomes? What are all the ways of doing this task? Is it, is it task parallel? Can I, can I set it off and tell somebody to do that task separately to me? Is it just the same sort of data? So I'm going to take a whole bunch of data, I'm going to split it up into small groups and pass it on to, to, to each CPU. Or is it such a task that I don't know what's about to happen? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to predict everything. Right, now I've got all this back up now. I'm going to predict everything. and. When one of the worlds lines up with my prediction, bang, I'll take that one. That's the future of parallel programming. That's the future of where these machines are going. And at the gathering here, when we're talking about the end of the universe, one of the interesting issues is if we have neural machines that are predicting every possible action we can take and are there sort of waiting for us. So we start moving our finger to hit a key, and it knows that that's the key we're about to hit and it predicts it, and we touch the key and bang, it's there. Right? Almost before we get to complete the action. At what point do we start following the instructions rather than issuing them? At what point is this massively parallel prediction system that we're, we're building going to be able to predict our movements so accurately that we don't actually need to issue instructions anymore? We just follow what it tells us we want to do. Because obviously, it's already worked out what our desires are. Right? That's going to be a weird situation to get into. And when I talk about the singularity on Saturday, I'm going to talk about some of those issues to do with when parallel processing creates so much power 
and so much predictive power that we as humans can no longer predict what is happening next. It goes out of our hands. And we stop being the in charge of the machines, and they start, with all of their parallel processing power, all of their ability to predict the future, they start making the future for us, and we just hold on and hope that we can keep up. Okay, thank you very much. Only one question.